Great job. Chad and Angela, you should be proud. Um, you know, we've seen your family grow up and seen them in church, and um, you've done well. You've done well, so I uh, take my hat off to you. It's awesome to see kids grow up and, and follow after what God wants for them. You know, in the pain of, of our children, in the pain of our life, there's always those doubts and there's always those fears. And when we're talking about today is the scars of our life. And, and as Jesus showed his scars. And the, the mindset of scars that Jesus is talking about, when Thomas was a follower of Jesus for three years, and, and that Jesus was just crucified, and they watched him, and he was buried. And the, the fear, and the doubt, and the anxiety of his followers thinking that if they crucified Jesus, I could be next. And the fear of the unknown, the fear of tomorrow. And Jesus allowed us a glimpse of pain into his body so we can see what God has in store for us. And in John chapter 20, verses 25 through 28, it talks about a man, the disciple Thomas, talks about his fears and how his fears of not understanding what has taken place and what is going to take place, Jesus does something that he wants to do with us as well. When we have a fear, anxiety, or doubt, and we take our petition unto God and say, I can't understand this, that's when God supernaturally comes within our life and gives to us exactly what we need to have to give to us that confidence and peace. Although it may have cost him he wants to give us something that we can just say, thank you. We can just say, thank you. In John chapter 20, verses 25 through 28, the other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see the hands and the prints of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, and the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he pointed out to Thomas, and he said, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. That doesn't sound like a, a wonderful, gigantic story. But you could put your unbelief in that story. And the thing that you, I just can't believe God can do that. I just don't understand why God will do that. And in the midst of your life and the fear and the anxieties, when you have no idea what to do, that's exactly what God does in your life as he did in Thomas's life. He came in the presence of Thomas and he said, I know what you have fears of. I know that you don't understand that I have been a resurrected body. I don't understand. And Thomas said, I can't believe. And Jesus said, look at my hands. Don't just look at my hands. Put your fingers in my nail prints. Put your fists in my side. Examine me. Try me. Make sure it's not something that you just hear, but it's something that you experience. And Allison said it so well. In Christianity, it is not something that we can just do. It's something that we just go to on Sunday morning. Christianity is something that we experience. We are all in. We do everything we can. And Jesus says, trust me. Try me. Look at me. The scars that I have, I have borne for you. You're going to have scars. You're going to have issues within your life. And that's where I come in. I come in in the midst of your scars, and I am going to fix you. A scar, it could, it could, be, it could be translated blemish. Something within your life that you're embarrassed about. And it may be physical, emotional, and it even could be spiritual. It's a blemish. 
is something that sometimes we try to hide. And it could be something that we have done, experience that we have done, or maybe an accident that we went through. It could be a physical scar on our face. It could be an emotional scar deep within our soul. And we try to hide it, and God says, I'm going to use those scars. And in order for God to use the scars, we have to be vulnerable to God and vulnerable to others. So my first thing is, why does God allow scars? Why does God even allow the scars? Wouldn't it be easier if, if uh, we didn't have those pains? If we didn't go through the catastrophes? We must address the role of the scar in the heart of a believer. See, every one of the disciples had scars. They had issues within their life. They have the fears. They have the anxieties. And they have the, the doubts that what Jesus went through was going to be for them. They assumed that it was going to be a coup to take over. They didn't realize that Jesus was going to leave and that Jesus was going to give to them the command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. They didn't know it was going to be their job to communicate and to start the church. They thought it was going to be easier than that. Scars can be open doors to others to see God's power. Because all of our scars, they're all different and they're all somewhat made in different ways. You could look at your body now, and I guarantee you there's some scar that you have within your body that you could look at that and you would say, oh yeah, I remember exactly when that took place. I remember what I was doing and how that was taking place. You look in a mirror, and the scar that you see, you're like, oh, wow, man. Everybody sees the scar. Everybody, the first thing they look at, and they see my deformity, or they see a scar on my face, or they see something wrong with me. And we, as the participants of the event, we look at that scar, and we will never forget it, and we feel like it's a blemish that everybody sees. But actually, people don't see the scar. Actually, people see past the scar. But we believe the scar is the priority, and people do not see your event. They love you for who you are. They want you to be satisfied and successful. But God sometimes has to use the scars in order to use the brokenness so God can be glorified in the event. I've often heard, experience is the best teacher. The scars of others should teach us how to be cautious and avoid the scar. You know, sometimes when you say experience is the best teacher, well, that's a good saying. And sometimes experience doesn't always turn out positive. I would say what we learn from our experience can be positive. But just because we experience things doesn't mean we are going to learn from those experiences. It's what is ingrained within our life when God puts things within our life. And we do have scars. Can that scar be something positive or is it dwelt within us and remains negative? They're scars. Whether it's in our mind or whether it's in our body. And as I was thinking about the scars, there's a story that, that uh, I can never get out of my mind. It was Christmas afternoon. Now, back in the old days, back in 19, probably 70, 72, I was about seven to eight years of age. Now, do you remember back in the little towns that they used to do the trash barrels? Anybody remember the trash barrels? Back when you can burn trash. And, and mom said, hey, Bruce, take all the trash out to the trash barrel. So all the wrapping papers we put in the trash barrel. And uh, then my big brother, he was supposed to burn the trash. Okay, But with a seven or eight-year-old kid, do you know what is the most awesome experience in the world? To play in the trash that's on fire. Now, the, back in the day, we had these big old cotton coats. Remember the, the cotton coats? The arms were like six inches big, and you, jog, and you look like you're a football player, and you're seven. So I was sitting out there, and nobody was around the trash bin. And the trash was just barreling with fire. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to get a stick, and I'm going to play with the trash. Okay? Anybody else do that, or is it just me? Am I the only crazy one around here? So I got a stick, and I was starting to play with the trash. And, and then the trash started going down, so I reached my hand over the barrel so I can push the trash down further. All of a sudden, my big coat got caught on fire. 
So what are you supposed to do? Well, let me say, if you were intelligent. Okay, I'm taking myself out of that equation right now. My coat got caught on fire. Ah! Give me what you're supposed to do. What did I do? Ran! And I was in the alley. So I started running down the alley. So all of a sudden, oxygen, momentum, my back was on fire. All of a sudden, I thought I was going to be on fire, third degree burns. So I was just booking down the alley. And my brother was playing. He was older and he was playing with somebody else. And he sees his younger brother running down the alleyway on fire. So what's he do? He, he's a boy scout. So he comes over, he runs, and he just tackles me. Oh, I'm on fire, what are you beating me up for? But he just rolls me over, rolls me, and my arms were all like all burnt, and, and they had to take me to the doctor. And I, but I always look back and I said, that was probably the scariest event for a seven-year-old that you could possibly imagine. So now, boys, don't play with fire. Why? Because I learned from my mistake. And I understand the stop, drop, and roll. I understand all that. But when you're seven years old, it is ingrained within your mind to play with fire. And sometimes, if we do not learn from our experience, the experience can cause major havoc. So can we learn from our mistakes? It may be something so simple as something that you experienced, simple as being caught on fire. But it may be an action that we perform, that we continue to do because we haven't learned from our experience. Our experiences can be the greatest teacher, but it can be the greatest enemy if we do not learn from what we are doing. Jesus taught us something. Scars have a purpose. Scars that I carry must be a visible witness. I have fought the battle and survived. Jesus was not ashamed to show his scars. They were more than just a trophy. They were a life event to tell people that he is who he said he was. He was Jesus, the Savior of the world. That the scars in his hand, the crown of thorns that dwelt within his head, the spear that went through his side, they were life long scars to show a world that they have been redeemed and in our scars if we are children of God the scars that we have can be a testimony if we allow the pain to be glorified into the future in John chapter 20 verse 25 the other disciples were there and said to Thomas we have seen the Lord but Thomas said to him except I see, except I see. Jesus heard Thomas. And there's people around us that have the same doubt that Thomas had. They see life, but they're saying, unless I see something, unless I see your life being tangible, different, unless I see a testimony, not just that you go to church, that I see that the scars that you have are for a purpose. And we can unveil our pain in order to let people see Christ is genuinely real within our life. Thomas just said, unless I see. And as soon as he said, unless I see, eight days later, just a little over a week, Jesus came to him and he said, Thomas, I want to give to you exactly what you asked. So in our invite series, when we are inviting somebody to get into our life, to invite them to see Christ, invite them into the church, what we first have to do is if we are going to invite them, we then have to become vulnerable to them. And when we become vulnerable to them and we start sharing the issues of our life, the pains and the fears of our life, the problems that I have, and then they come up and say, you know what, I need to see. I, 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 I hear the preacher I enjoy the music, but that's church. What about your scars? I can come to church, but you know what? Church on a Sunday morning is not going to be a life-changing event. I want to know if the people, if the person that have the scars, 
Is it genuinely real to you? And Thomas looked at him and he said, unless I see it, I cannot believe. And then Jesus came to him and he said, here, put your fingers in my fingers, your fist through my side. And then he said, blessed are you who have believed because you have seen. But more blessed are those that believe, that haven't seen the scars, but they believe the testimony of those that have seen the star, scars. Your life is an event. It's a testimony. We must live our life. Jesus knows your faith level no matter what, what, it, what it comes across, whether it is a facade or whether it's genuine. He knows our faith and he knows our level of, lo of love. Uh, so uh, number four, stupidity and failure must not dictate the future. Uh, stupidity and failure. Has anybody, now, I don't mean that word negative, you know, you're supposed to use the word stupid, but has anybody ever felt stupid spiritually? Have you ever really done something that you thought, that was pretty stupid? Give me a hand, give me an amen. Okay, don't lie. Give me a lie. Uh, amen. No, I've never done anything stupid. You know, we've all done stupid things. And we've all felt like a failure. We've all felt like, man, what can God do with me? And and I've said this many times. Here's what Satan does. If you can get anything from this, here's what Satan does. Satan takes your worst moment. He takes the moment that you feel the most insecure, or if we can use the, the, the stupidest, the time that, that you made the worst mistake, the time that you are down and out the worst, the time that you got mad the worst, the time that you lost your temper the worst. Uh, Brett makes fun of me because I used to coach basketball and there's something about me that's sometimes over the top in competitive nature. Don't know what it is. But we were winning the ball game. We were going up for a, Bryce Haight was going up for a layup. The guy got fouled. And the referee didn't call a thing. Didn't call a thing. I mean, he got killed. And I kind of lost my way a little bit. And I jumped all over the referee's case a little bit. And then they knew that I was a preacher and I lost my testimony. And I said, if, you know, and it, it, was, it was bad. It was bad. I just like, stupid, stupid, stupid. But here's what Satan does. In that moment when I lost my temper, my eyes were big and ah! Satan takes a snapshot. And then anytime I think, you know what, I should coach, Satan goes, here's what you do. This is who you are. You are a psycho, crazy fanatical. There's no way that you should. There's no way that you could be used of God. This is who you are. And I look at that snapshot and I say, I am. I'm a crazy dude. I shouldn't do anything. I can't communicate God's love. I can't talk about forgiveness. I can't talk about patience and love and joy. And here, that's who you are. My eyes wide open. Satan goes, that's who you are. And that's what I believe I am. Because that's what Satan wants me to believe that I am. But you know that scar? I can say, you know what? I probably shouldn't coach because when I lose my temper, I don't give God the glory. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be a fan in the stands and let somebody else do the coaching because I want to glorify God. I can learn from my mistakes and I don't have to be the scar. I can learn from it. And I cannot give God, I cannot let Satan get the glory because of my stupidity or my ignorance. There's a story in the Bible of a man found in Luke chapter 15. Maybe you can identify with this one. His dad had a lot of resources. A lot of land, a lot of cattle. He got tired of doing the deja vu over and over and over and over. He's 20 years old. He's been doing this since he's been 15 years old, feeding the cattle, doing everything, doing everything that his daddy wanted to do. So finally he said, I'm tired of this. Dad, you're an old man. Your days are almost over. I don't want to wait till you die. Why don't you just give me all your money now? I've got a brother. Why don't we just split it? And the dad, in the culture of the day, said, okay, that's what you want. I, I don't want you to leave. But if that's what you ask, and 
I'll do that. So he divided amongst the two brothers his inheritance. And the one older brother stayed with his dad and worked and didn't do anything wrong, but he didn't do anything. He just stayed with his father. But the younger son, the Bible says, he went to a far land, and he wasted his inheritance and righteous living. In other words, he did some stupid things. And a famine came to the land, and it came to the land that it ate up all of his profits, all of his resources, to a point that there was nothing for him. So he hired on as somebody that would even feed the swine, the lowest degrading position in the culture. He hired on. And after a few days or a few weeks of that, he came to the point and he said, this stinks. My father's servants has it better than me. So there's a phrase found in Luke chapter 15 that is very important. The phrase is, one day he came to himself. What that means is someday he just realized, I'm foolish. I have made some mistakes. What I am doing is not good for what I want to do. We call it the prodigal son, but it also could be called the forgiving father. Because the prodigal son came to himself, he understood what he did, he said, enough, enough! I am going to draw the line in the sand. I'm not going to go any further. I'm going to stop from what I'm doing, and I am going to say, I am going to go back, not as my father's son. I'm going to go back, even as a servant, to bow under the authority of my father and just say, I am sorry. I made mistakes. I have scars within my life. So he takes the journey back. The beautiful story of the father waiting on the porch, his son walking down the aisleway, and he sees his father. He bows his head. And when he looks up, he sees that his father is starting to run after him. And now he's embarrassed. What's dad going to say? Is dad going to kick me to the curb? Is dad going to tell me to leave? Is dad going to say, you wasted my inheritance? Is dad going to say, you're a scoundrel. I don't want you around here anymore. But as soon as his father got there, he fell on his face, his knees, and he said, Father, I am not worthy to be your son. And his father gets down, picks him up. He calls his servants around, and he said, give this man a robe which represents he is my son this is my home he is my son give this man a ring talks about authority whatever he says i say he is my son from my home with my authority and then he said give to him a pair of shoes get these dirty sandals off of him which talks about forgiveness it makes no difference where he has gone makes no difference how dirty his feet are. I forgive him. And then he said, I'm going to throw a party. I'm going to throw a party. My son was lost. He decided to come home. And I am excited. Kill a fatted calf and throw a party. And I believe that boy that made a lot of mistakes, learned a great bit about God's love and his father's forgiveness from that event. And I believe when that boy came back into his home, he didn't look at his father the same way. He didn't look at his father as the, as the old man with a lot of money that's wasting his time. He didn't look at the old man and say, why don't you just go ahead and die so I can get my inheritance? He looked at dad as saying, Wow. You know, when I was 21, I didn't think you were very smart. But you know, when I left, and I realized I couldn't do it on my own, and I came back, you're about the smartest man I've ever met because you understood forgiveness, brokenness, and restoration. That boy had scars. He learned from his scars but he didn't let his failures or his stupidity keep him from doing ultimately what God wanted him to do. 
And sometimes we can look at our life and we can say, I've done too much or I'm too wayward. And I believe Jesus is saying, no. No, that's where you were. You made some stupid mistakes. You got a few scars on you. But as long as you come to yourself, as long as you understand where you are, as long as you understand who I am, allow me to forgive you, allow me to restore you, it makes no difference if you're 15 years old or 65 years old. I'm going to forgive you. And here's the kicker. Don't keep it from being who I am. Don't keep what you do or what you did from doing what I want you to do. Allow the scar to remain so you can be glorifying me. Peter thought he was strong. Peter failed, but he wasn't a failure. He thought he was strong. The boy that left his father, he was arrogant. He thought he deserved it. Peter was arrogant. He thought he would not fail. There's a difference between a boy wanting to experience life than a follower of Christ that said, I am too good to fail. I am too strong to fail. Jesus told him the day before he was going to be crucified, today you'll, cru you'll deny me three times. Peter laughed at him. He said, Father, I will never deny you. And Jesus looked at him intently. And he said, before tomorrow morning, you're going to deny me three times. And I'm sure Peter thought, no way. No way. Do you know who I am? I am Peter. I am the rock. You just called me the rock. Upon the church, it's me. That's what he thought. All of a sudden, the guards came. They started beating on Jesus, throwing his elbows in his face, using sticks, pushing him, beating the dog out of Jesus. And the fear that Peter had started saying, Whoa. I'm not near as bad as I think I am. I really don't want this to happen to me. I really don't want to be associated with Jesus if they're going to be doing that. So Peter denied Jesus three times. All of a sudden, the rooster crowed. Jesus said, gazed into Peter's eyes. And Peter, in his heart, said, I am. The Bible says that Peter went off and wept bitterly because of his failure. But here's what Jesus did. After the crucifixion, and after the resurrection, Jesus talking to his disciples, and he said, tell the disciples and Peter. When you fail, when you have a scar, if you are willing to allow that scar to be used for God, here's what Jesus will say. Tell Glenville and Javier to come. Tell Glenville and David to come. Because God knows us personally. And God knows our hearts ultimately. So God knows when we fail him, if we are contrite, if we're broken, he wraps his arms around us and says, it's not about your arrogance. It's not about your foolishness. It's about have you learned from your mistakes and are the scars within your life willing to be used for God's glory? And then great people fail and they get up and they try again. People fail, but they get up and they try again. You know, when I ask you, how many of you have been stupid? How many of you have failed? How many of you have felt like you have failed God? We would all raise our hand and say, today, this week, we've all failed God. There's a story in the Bible of Paul. It was Saul. And on the road to Damascus, he was blinded by God's light. And Saul's conversion came to a point that he became one of the greatest communicators of the gospel of all times. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Here's what Paul could have done. He could have looked at his life and said, not me. I was a persecutor of the Christians. I did too much wrong. 
But God looked at his disciples. And Jesus said this. He said, I've tried it with these guys. I tried to change the world with my 12 disciples, and they're kind of stumbling around. So Jesus looked at his disciples. He said, I need somebody new. I need somebody fresh. The disciples were doing their thing, but Paul wasn't in the midst of it. And Jesus says, I want something fresh. I want somebody that has experienced life. I want somebody with passion. I want somebody with authority. And Jesus chose Paul. And he said, I know that you have failed. I know your background, but I know your passion within your soul. And I know what your abilities are. And Paul could have looked, I failed you too much. But Jesus said, you're too good. You're too important. And here's what God does with our passions. If we have passions that are away from what God wants, he takes us, he saves us, he changes us, he keeps our abilities, he keeps our gifts, he keeps who we are, and he changes our focus. So in our life, when we have failed, in our passions, if we're motivated to do something, but yet I do want to honor God, God does this. If we come to ourselves and we have a passion for him, what he'll do, he'll take us who we are. When I was saved, I'm still Bruce Thomas. I have the same personality. I have the same gifts. But God says, I want to change your direction. I want to change what you do. I want to change how you do it. But who you are is at the essence. But when we fail, when we're open before God, God says, I love you. I have forgiven you. The pain, the scars, and the issues of your life are to glorify and to honor me. Just like a young girl that grew up in the church, had a few bumps along the road, came to a point that said, I want to give God my life. It could be a 50-year-old man. It could be a 60-year-old lady. It doesn't change the fact that God wants our hearts at any age. He wants us to honor him. Our scars may be bigger. Some may be more grotesque than others. Some may be more painful to see, but they're all very vulnerable because they're ours. They're our scars. They're ours. And what we have to do is we have to give our scars, our life, our fears to Jesus. And when we do that, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, I love the verse, love never fails. When we love God and we say, if I give you my life, if I give my insecurities, my vulnerabilities, Jesus says, I love you and I will never fail you. I will never leave you. I'm going to keep you. Where where in your life, where is it in your journey? Where is it in your emotions that you're saying, God, I'll give you this, but man, this hurts too much. We take a counseling term And we say this during pain of counseling, saying that uh, in your relationships, somebody, you've taken your heart out of your chest and you've given it to somebody. And somebody didn't treat your heart right. They'd taken your heart and they threw it against the wall. They stamped on it and they threw it in the dirt and, and your heart has been broken. It's dirty and... There's something happened in that relationship and they say, you know what, I don't want your heart anymore. Take your heart back. So you have in your chest or in your hand a dirty, broken, bruised, and battered heart. So you take that heart, you try to clean it up, and you put it back in your chest. And you say, nobody, nobody will ever treat my heart that way again. So we become so bold and so standoffish. Say, no, I'm not going to let anybody have my heart. 
And then we come to church and we say, Jesus wants your heart. You can trust in him. You can trust that he will take care of you. It's not me. I've tried that. I don't want to do that. Or maybe it's a different percent, uh, relationship. You fall in love with somebody. And you're saying, I want to try. But it's very hard to pull my heart out and give my heart to somebody else. Because of the scars of your heart, you're fearful of the future of how somebody else will handle that heart. So we are guarded within our relationships. We're guarded to a point that we don't want anybody to see our scars and our pains and our emotions. And God is saying, you have to trust me. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind. And if you trust me, I will direct your paths. I will give to you your very desires of your heart. But just because of the pain of the past, of your emotions and your heart and your life, we cannot hold what God wants to do within your life because of failures and pains of the past. We have to give our scars, our pains, our fears to God and allow God to heal, to love, and then God will take your heart, take your life, take your emotions and say, trust in me. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be your provider, your protector because it's my heart. It's mine that I want to direct. So in our life, in our scars, in our pains, in our fears, in our scars, if we want to tell a story, if we want God to be glorified in our past, if we want God to allow our past to glorify God in the future, we have to open up and allow the pains the hurts, and the scars to be a tool that God can use to point people that are and that have gone through your junk to see that there's hope. See, when Thomas saw Jesus, and Jesus said, look, your biggest fear, your insecurities, your unbelief, they're right here. And if we are believers in Christ, we are Christ-like ones. There are people that have no faith in God because they can't see a, believing, a believer that has shared his life and the scars that are in your life, the pains that they are going through, the fears that they have, the junk that they're going through. All they need is to see somebody that have the same scars that's gone through the same stuff, that has the same failures, but have put their failures under the blood of Jesus and gave them hope and a future and security. So I'm asking the church, it's your story that they want to see. It's your life that they need to hear. Next week, next week we're going to take the word invite. I-N-V-I-T-E. And we're going to use an acrostic sermon to that word. And there's going to be six individuals, six families, or six individuals that are going to come up. And they're going to share how somebody impacted their life because of an invite. Or how they impacted somebody's life because they invited. And we're going to use stories. Real life, real stories how God used them to change somebody else's life. There's not a greater testimony than a true life story of Jesus and his transformation power. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you and we thank you for your love. And Lord, the pains and the scars that we have, I pray that you'll just protect us and help us and allow us to become who you want us to be and Lord, forgive us where we fail you and let us come to ourselves and understand that you are the purpose and you are the reason. We thank you for our stories. We thank you for testimonies. 
Allow us to be genuine in our life so you can transform us to give hope to a hurting world, to people that need a relationship with you. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.